we're about to join an international team of explorers using ultralight aircraft and kayaks to take a Himalayan river run. Sixty-five years ago, man made his first attempt to climb Mount Everest. Since then, hundreds of Himalayan expeditions have set out to conquer one of these formidable peaks. But this is the story of a different journey, an attempt to conquer not the ice, but the air and water of the Himalaya. Using tiny ultralight aircraft to help with the reconnaissance of the deep gorges, a group of kayakers sets out to run the river that has its source in the glaciers of Everest itself, the Dug Cozy. All expeditions into the hills of Nepal begin from the country's ancient capital, the city of Kathmandu. The team consists of six kayakers, two pilots, a climber, and the expedition doctor. The leader is a 28-year-old Londoner, Mick Coyne. One One Get out of here. <laughs> Expeditions require months of planning, both at home and in Kathmandu. Mike Cheney has spent 20 years providing advice and local organization, and with his partner, Ren Chen Yonjen, obtaining bureaucratic clearance for innumerable groups of climbers and travelers. Without the help of someone like Mike Cheney, no major expedition could be mounted in Nepal. Right at the top of the icefall, you may want to try and land at Goat Shep. Um, that might well be possible. Well, height uh, sculpture. That's 17,000 feet. So it may be, it must be right on the limit of what you can do. But if you do that, you'll probably get a world record or something. Uh, all right, Mike. Yep. Yeah, a white water kayak must fit the kayaker tighter than a glove. Ah, that's good. <laughs> Is that the last one to do? You're right. Yeah, no, he's got this one the kayak other. arrives from the factory as an empty shell, and by means of rigid foam inserts, each craft can be tailored precisely. The team has brought a total of 16 kayaks, expecting that several will be destroyed or lost in the descent. The ultralight pilots have their own preparations to complete. No one has ever flown these machines before in Nepal, let alone even contemplated taking them somewhere as treacherous as the high peaks of the Himalaya. The first stage of the trip from Kathmandu to Mount Everest is along a winding mountain road Although it is only 120 miles long, the journey takes 12 hours. That is still a great improvement, because until recently, much of the distance had to be covered on foot. At the end of the road, the real Nepalese transport system takes over. From now on, everything has to be carried by porters. But Everest is still nearly 100 miles away, and the total weight of the equipment is more than three tons. Most of the porters, including the women, carry between 55 and 60 pounds. Those with kayaks have a lighter but much more awkward load. 30 porters are required just to carry fuel for the ultralights, and another four are needed to carry a spare ultralight wing. Altogether, there are 150 people in the column. For the first six days, the route crosses ridge after mountain ridge. Each day begins with a steady 3,000-foot climb, 
but by afternoon the trail descends again to the floor of the next valley. It is slow and exhausting work, but this is how the process works almost everywhere in Nepal. As the main party of the expedition inches its way across the foothills, the two ultralights fly in by a different route. For this back-breaking work, each porter is paid about $2.50 a day. Out of that, nearly half goes for food and lodging, leaving about $1.25. And since they are not paid for the return journey, their net profit is less than 70 cents a day. For awkward loads like kayaks, they get a little extra. The highest pass in the first week of the journey stands at a height of 11 and a half thousand feet. The trail then descends more than 6,000 feet, leaving the group 1,200 feet lower than they were at the start of the trip. After six days of walking, the kayakers are rewarded with their first sight of the river. It is not a reassuring prospect. Although the expedition was timed to reach the river at the end of the monsoon season, when the water would be at its height, no one had expected it to be quite so powerful. Like Bart said, that there's been a big flood down here, and, you know, about last year time. I can't, which, I mean, which way would you get down here, Mick? It's crazy, we're not fresh. We've been walking six days. I'd give you a miss, Rog. Three weeks' time, I think we're looking at it differently. It would have dropped a couple of feet. Anyway, I don't want you to bait. No. While the kayakers were inspecting the river, the pilots were getting their first taste of flying in high mountains. Every foot of extra altitude alters the handling of the ultralights and increases their airspeed, making landing much more difficult. In the steep mountain gorges, an engine failure would mean almost certain death. The pilots, Simon Baker and David Young, have brought parachutes just in case. Their teacher is team member Phil Bond, a British Air Force parachuting instructor. Single canopy, and it's 24 foot in diameter. OK, if you'd like to pull the handle then, Simon, and we'll see what happens. All right, so you've got your auxiliary parachute. The back peels off, and then the airflow then takes us away. Parachute first. And then from there, the payout, the rigging lines as well. The ultralights are now flying at 15,000 feet above sea level and are becoming more difficult to handle. The pilots have brought with them two types of wing, a standard version and a specially adapted model, which they have christened the Kumbu Raven. To cope with the problems of high altitude, they attached the new wings to both aircraft. At 12,200 feet, this landing strip is undoubtedly the highest in the area. A thousand feet below it lies the small town of Namche Bazaar. 
Namche Bazaar is the administrative and commercial center for the Kumbu region. It is also the home of the Sherpas, the famous Nepalese tribe that provides the high altitude porters for climbing expeditions. <laughs> Tourism and expeditions have brought relative prosperity to Namche Bazaar. At one time, the Sherpas were among the poorest people in Nepal, but now eight or nine thousand foreign trekkers pass through this region every year, and a cash economy has developed. <laughs> Because there are no more airstrips above this point, the pilots have time on their hands. Above Namche, the vegetation changes, and the group slows down to acclimate to the high altitude. Only 15 years ago, one out of every 50 visitors to this area used to die from altitude sickness. Now, with greater understanding of the problem, there are far fewer deaths. Meanwhile, Mary Ganjakowski, the expedition doctor, is persuaded to offer her services in pursuit of a new ultra-lighting record. The pilots want to find out if they can take off at such high altitude carrying a passenger. Mary, the smallest and lightest member of the team, is the obvious guinea pig. Built by a Japanese hotel consortium, the airstrip is now abandoned. As the ultralight roars down the runway, no one knows exactly what will happen. But it works. When Explorer continues, there'll be more high-flying adventure on our kayak trip through the Himalayas. And later, meet a couple of... Followed by David Young in the second ultralight, they set off towards Everest. flight, Simon and Mary reached 17,000 feet. For two people, another record. Records aside, from a purely practical point of view, they have proved the ultralights could carry kayakers on river reconnaissance. That was fantastic. Two days march, or ten minutes flying time, further up the valley, the main group is building an airstrip. Under the firm direction of the head porter, the job is completed in two days, which at this altitude is fast work indeed. What a baby, eh? What a big baby. Yeah. <laughs> There is a very basic instruction in the ultralight handbook which says simply, do not fly in mountains. 
Although it looks beautiful and perhaps easy, only highly experienced and skillful pilots could hope to survive flying at these altitudes and in these fast-changing and dangerous climatic conditions. At double the normal speed and on a crude runway, it requires a certain courage to even attempt a landing in this place. We might roll backwards. Is that a good runway or what? That's a brilliant runway. Two, days. Two days to fix it. That's excellent. Oh, it's a wee bit rough. Yeah. At 14 and a half thousand feet, the aircraft hits the ground at 60 miles per hour. Only special suspension prevents the machine from being smashed. Yes, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Nice man. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. It's easy, it's hard to get high sometimes. It looks like you're in a bit of trouble. Yeah, but it was... Uh, Quite bumpy in places, wasn't it? Yeah. This I would have taken off that second, third, and fourth hill. <laughs> 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 uh, what do you want? Fourteen and a half thousand feet in the Himalaya? You expect it? Uh, uh, yeah. Listen. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Happy For the first time, the whole team is assembled in one place. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear my <laughs> Give me the biggest one. You must be. There isn't the biggest one, Roger. They're all exactly the same size. Yeah. I'll have that small one that's closest to me. You know, the one about three inches across. Come on, boy. Yeah, a real world. Come on. They have almost reached the source of the river, but before they begin their descent, there is one more record to be broken. They intend to land an ultralight higher than anyone else has ever attempted. In the shadow of Mount Everest they find one tiny flat space. The problem is, the higher we get, the more runway he's going to need. We've probably got about 150 <laughs> metres here, which probably isn't long enough technically. So we've got a big run out at the end, which we've got to clear the rocks out of. Basically, we've got to make it as flat and as smooth as possible. Just get rid of all the big rocks so that if he comes in and he's gone too fast, he doesn't kill himself. Now, the weather's pretty grotty. <coughs> it gets much worse, the porters won't work, which means it's down to us. Obviously, no one's going to be able to work very fast because of the altitude problem. At 17,000 feet, they assume this must be the world's highest runway. The next day, the weather is perfect. Where is it? Can you see it? He's just, just coming across the front Got of the face there, moving towards Everest. It must be high. I must be 20,000 20, feet. It looks really good. Yeah. At 20,000 feet, flying with a standard engine that delivers only half its normal power, Simon Baker is operating at the very limits of ultralight technology. 18,000 feet. It looks so close to those mountains. It looks like it's going to crash into them. <laughs> Still on full power. I don't know why he's not letting the power off to start the descent. I think it must be frozen on. Simon's throttle has frozen, and at an approach speed of 90 miles an hour, he is forced to switch off and glide. Without power, he has to get it right the first time. <laughs> Fantastic! That's um, 17,000 feet. It's wrong. It's 500 feet out. The map says 17,500. 17,500? Oh, yeah. Simon. Brilliant. Well done, mate. Congratulations, Simon. Oh, you're I would say that was an equivalent of a grade six river. Definitely. Brilliant. Well done, mate. <laughs> because of the lie of the runway, it is impossible to take off again. But that presents no problem with an ultralight. You simply take it apart. Push. <clears throat> 
In about 40 minutes, the machine is broken into loads small enough to be carried. They trudge away from Everest, unaware that one of their accomplishments has been surpassed. On the same day Simon took off from 17,000 feet, a Frenchman who had crashed landed on Mount Kilimanjaro managed to take off again from 18,000 feet. The expedition's triumph was short-lived. On the way down the glacier, they passed the source of the Dudkozi River. The river becomes navigable at 14,000 feet. Eleven years ago, another expedition attempted to run this river, but they were forced to bypass very large sections of it. With better equipment and modern techniques, these kayakers hope to do better. This is no small ambition for the Dude Cozy is a mighty river. Dude Cozy means Milk River. It is a fitting name for a head lie 80 miles of continuous white water. As the kayakers begin their journey, the pilots prepare for their task of carrying out reconnaissance in the gorges downstream. next 80 miles, the river drops more than 11,000 feet. This altitude is so thin that within minutes of setting out, the kayakers are fighting for breath. The upper part of the river flows straight from a glacier, and the water is bitterly cold. Sometimes so is the weather. In Europe and North America, the fastest rivers that are run by kayakers drop at the rate of 200 feet per mile. The Dude Cozy is cascading down its valley twice as fast. This entire part of the river is filled with treacherous rocks. Every few yards, they are smashed into something. We will return to National Geographic Explorer after these messages. National Geographic Explorer. With every mile, the river becomes faster, more powerful, and more dangerous.
This is Roger Hyten, famous for taking part in the first expedition to Dube Cozy some 11 years ago. Mike Hewlett, a computer programmer by trade, and in his spare time, one of Britain's top whitewater paddlers. Mick Coyne, ex-Marine, veteran of several wild adventures, and leader of the expedition. John Taylor, at 37, the oldest member of the team, and the expedition administrator. And Phil Bond, the parachuting instructor. One of the major hazards of whitewater kayaking is to be pinned against a rock. In the worst case, a man can be trapped underwater and drown. Or the boat can fold up so that it is impossible to kick free. The last member of the team is Chan Swanzik, a superb kayaker from Colorado. He handles his craft with the elegance of a dancer. Eight miles of furious paddling, they reach a point where the river becomes impassable. It is the first of two similar stretches they will be unable to complete. As in any dangerous sport or occupation, the art of survival lies in knowing when enough is enough. For the next seven miles, the kayaks have to be carried along the mountain trails. One day, the technology and techniques may be sufficient to tackle such water, but for now, it is clearly impossible. When they return to the water, the river has been joined by two large tributaries. It is wider, deeper, faster, and much more powerful. The chief feature of the river is its relentless rush, which allows almost no chance to rest and barely time to think as one hazard is followed by yet another. One such danger is a kind of standing wave called a stopper. Under certain conditions, it can suck a man down and hold him underwater virtually forever. The trick to handling a stopper is to carefully work your way out to one side, and then to break free. All 
the members of the team are using boats made of polyethylene. Until a few years ago, whitewater kayaks were constructed from fiberglass, but no fiberglass craft could have withstood the battering these boats have taken. The small red kayaks were actually designed for use in swimming pools, but in the last three years, a few top kayakers have been experimenting with them on white water. Shooting falls like this is a newly developing art, and you have to be sure of what is at the bottom. There is one very quick way to find out, but to get jammed in the rocks under such a weight of water would mean certain death. I'd say the way that all those boils just push everything back in there, you just got to turn off on that rock, fall back nicely into that stock, go down into those boils, and just sort of bubble around and stay there. Yeah. Sounds pretty fair. The advantage of these kayaks, called rotobats, is that their short length makes them easier to maneuver, and their rounded stubby shape means they are less likely to get trapped among the rocks. The disadvantages are that they are less buoyant and extremely unstable in rough water, demanding a very high degree of skill from the kayaker. Acknowledged by his companions as the best paddler, demonstrates his expertise over a particularly nasty fall. The others are not quite so successful. Battered from all sides by the turbulence, Roger Hyten would comment later that the only thing he was aware of at this moment was that he was upside down. John Taylor is equally disoriented. Once out of the boat, a kayaker is entirely at the mercy of the river and dependent on the skill and courage of his friends for rescue. This time, Mike Hewlett reaches John and together they head for safety. When another man is hanging on to his boat, the kayaker loses most of his control, placing his own life at risk. But it is a point of honor to attempt a rescue. Roger Hyten once had a close friend who came to his rescue, and the friend was drowned. Mike and John make it to the bank, but elsewhere, there has been a disaster. The adventure. High Valley's David Young's ultralight was caught in a violent downdraft. He and his machine were smashed into the mountainside at 80 miles an hour. Incredibly, David survived the impact. His second piece of luck was that the accident happened three miles from an aid post staffed by two American doctors, Ben Levine and Bill Guitar. They reached the crash site within an hour and a half, along with an American medical student and a Swiss expedition doctor. Levine and Guitar stayed with David for the next 24 hours. Without their help, he would almost certainly have died from severe internal injuries.
The day after the crash, a helicopter flew David to Kathmandu for an immediate operation. A week later, he was visited by Mary Ganjakowski. I thought I was going to pull around and make it. I saw the, the sky coming around and everything else coming into place. And, uh, and then I just knew at the end and uh, I said, ah, and bang, tumble, tumble. And, uh, and I was sort of falling off the side of the wing. And when I crashed, I felt this big tug at my stomach, uh, which was the seatbelt. And, um, and I, I, I remember rolling gently off the, off the wing and uh, I just had this terrible pain in my, uh, in my stomach. Uh, climbers fall off mountains and pilots crash airplanes. And, uh... and kayakers regularly fall out of their boats. Swimming in this water is as dangerous as being caught in a mountain avalanche. Luckily, Paul Main, the expedition climber, had managed to scramble onto a rock. If a man is swept away by this river, he moves faster than his companions can run along the bank. Having lost the first safety rope, Paul must catch the second. But the water is too powerful, and he is gone. By sheer luck, he is swept into an eddy. It was very nearly a second disaster. Ahead lies a 70-mile-long gorge. The original intention had been to carry out a reconnaissance by ultralight, but Simon Baker's machine had broken down, and David Young had been returning with replacement parts when he crashed. The kayakers had been told that only the first few miles of the gorge were white water, and that thereafter the river slowed. The team decided to go on blind, even though once committed, they could not turn back. At the end of the gorge, where the Dude Cozy joins a larger river, the Sun Cozy, the kayakers were to meet up with Mary and Paul, who were bringing in fresh supplies. Thinking that the trip will last only two or three days, they take very little food and equipment with them. Mike Hewlett leads the way. Only a superb kayaker like Mike could hope to get out of this stopper the right way up. Next comes Phil Bond. Swept underwater, he is lucky to survive. This is the beginning of a nightmare adventure. In the end, it turned out that ahead lay another 45 miles of continuous white water, which the group later agreed was the worst they had ever faced became a simple battle for survival. Though they could drag the kayaks up the sides of the gorge around some of the roughest water, at other times they had no choice but to go right through it. Instead of only two or three days, 
they emerged a full nine days later. Although they occasionally had managed to buy food from isolated Nepalese villages, sometimes they had nothing more than boiled potatoes and hot water flavored with lemon juice. At the merging of the Dude Cozy and the Sun Cozy, they are met by Mary, Paul, and Jeb Stewart, a rafter from California. I'm leaving in 20 minutes. Eh? What? <laughs> Where are you going? Oh, sorry to hear that. Still, don't mind. I'm sure it'd be a nice walk. The most difficult portion of the journey has now been completed, but it is far from over. Ahead are another 100 miles of the Sun Cozy River, at the end of which lies a small town. There the mountains end and the great Indian plain begins. But at the moment, the kayakers are just glad to be alive. Unexpectedly, the ultralights appear. To celebrate their return, the pilots put on an awesome display of low-level flying. very nearly overdoes it. After David Young's crash, the team had sent a message to England asking for spare parts and another pilot. The message said, flying here extremely dangerous, only Malcolm McBride acceptable. With only 24 hours notice, Malcolm had left for Nepal, where he single-handedly rebuilt David's aircraft. It's good, it's good. That's David. Fine. So which were the bits that were recovered from Dave's machine? This and this and this. <laughs> oh, and the fuel tank. Oh, that's, that's it, is it? That's about it, yeah. Well. <laughs> oh, and good. the wheels. The wheels are all right. United once again, the expedition can now go forward as originally planned. The job of the ultralight pilots is to fly just ahead of the main party so that they can warn the team of any potential danger. Depending on the water level, which can fluctuate several feet within two or three days, or at times within hours, there is a chance of encountering 15-foot waves in the narrower parts of the river. It is no longer possible to have porters carry food and equipment, so river rafts will be used to transport the supplies. Jeb Stewart is in charge of the rafting party. In order to meet up with the kayakers, the Nepalese crew has already floated down 100 miles of the Sun Cozy. There is still another 100 to go. We 
Leaving the rafts behind, the ultralights head down the river to pick up fuel and supplies from a town beyond the mountains. They get an enthusiastic welcome. Wary of leaving the machines at the mercy of so many inquisitive fingers, Simon and Malcolm are unable to shop for supplies. It is as much as they can manage to clear a space for takeoff. days after drinking champagne at the mouth of the Duke Cozy, and eight weeks and 450 miles after getting on the bus in Kathmandu, the team has almost reached the end of their journey. With startling suddenness, the mountains end, and the river flows gently onto the vast expanse of the Indian Plain. From the point at which the kayakers first put into the water, the river has dropped nearly 14,000 feet. And the distance they paddled through the torrents of the Dude Cozy was at least three times greater than was covered by the first expedition 11 years earlier. Two stretches of river still prove to be impassable, but it will be many years before anyone can better their achievement. Adventure is made possible by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Hi, I'm Dodge Morgan. Adventurers are a funny breed. They often seem to be looking for the hardest route to get somewhere or figuring out some new way to get themselves hurt. But in fact, what they're really doing is testing themselves, looking inside to see how far they can go. That's what our film tonight is about.